Good morning, good evening, everyone who's joining us tonight. Um, we are happy to see you and we welcome you uh, to our new program called In Studio for the Record. And um, as some of you might uh, know, we um, date in our music uh, production programming and um, we have a very wonderful guest tonight with us, um, Jared. Um, Jared Selter um, is a very extensive and very impressive uh, span of uh, work um, in the music. Um, he, his roles range, range from sound designer uh, to music director for HBO's Max Legendary, uh, not to even mention his current leadership at uh, Roland's education programs. Um, but here's where it gets kind of personal today. We invite you to do, be part of this stream. So if you have a burning question, you can ask it away during the stream. Uh, or if you want to steer the music uh, in some direction, it's also very welcome. Um, so join us as we dive into the world of music with Jared, exploring the intricacies of sound design, the creative process behind the composition, and the theory that makes music resonate with listeners around the world. Um, so hi jared hey uh, great intro yes how are you feeling how is uh the weather in los angeles <laughs> <laughs> you know very well how it is because you saw my open door it was super nice um i wanted to show you all that but i decided to close the door uh things are great i'm i'm super excited to be here i got my stuff set up to make this work and yeah i'm, I'm looking forward to hearing what you all want to hear and what you want to know about um, so you're in your own studio right now, right? Uh, can you tell a little bit about how did you become to um, build it? Or... Sure. No, that's a good shape. question. So yeah. I, I think a little history of, you know, the bedroom producer, which I have always been, I do have a uh, background in guitar, but as I got more and more things going, you know, money got big enough. It was really HBO that basically funded this room but to be honest this room was a shed that only half of it was usable and we expanded it out it's not treated it's not perfect it, it works great for me for what i needed to do though and i'm super blessed to even have a space to do stuff like this in. it is incredible and um so when you go to your studio do you always uh, like come there with some sense of purpose, you know exactly what you're going to do, or is it also like a, just an open mind creative set? Um, yeah, sometimes I like run in here with like a great idea. Sometimes I like shuffle in here super dejected and like I'm not inspired. Sometimes honestly, I come in here and I do paperwork for like seven hours a day. So it, it, oh. it's all just, well, to answer your question, I feel a lot of different ways coming in here, but at the end of the day, I have to get things done. Exactly. And sometimes I don't feel like doing it, doing it. And sometimes I'm so excited to do it. Like actually today I am. <laughs> we are very excited too. Um, so if you just um, imagine yourself, well, practically just now at the moment, and you know that um, you have this intention, desire to create music, to write a song, where do you start? It's a good question. So it depends on what it is. If like, if I consider this group here, the artist, then I'll say, well, what are, you, what are we doing? What genre? If you ask the genre question, then tempo is, is my first thing that I try to figure out. Because if you say hip hop, right. then, I, you know, or whatever it, it may be, uh, the tempo is the first thing. So tempo I do first, honestly, you know, you'll hear a lot of producers say, well, I do melody first, I do chords first. I figured out that I pretty much like to start with some kind of drum pattern, but it doesn't have to be that way. Uh, that's usually what I do, though, come up with some kind of drum pattern. Um, I, I have this, or you don't see it yet, but my uh, phone is set up to show the equipment that I'm going to use other than Ableton Live. Um, once, once that comes on screen, I'll show you what's on my desk, and you can kind of get how I do the workflow. You do see guitars in the back and a bass. That's a big thing for me, even though I've done a lot of electronic music where I don't even use the guitar, even though that's my main instrument. It's kind of like it bugs me, but it is what it is. And 
this here is my keyboard controller. Oh, good, perfect. So this is the System 8, which, as, as Robert mentioned, I work for Roland, but I've been a Roland user for a long time. This interfaces with my plugins, which, which we'll go through, and you'll see. This is a push two. I know they have the push three now, but I haven't got that together. I use this to record. It's really convenient for me, and you'll probably see how that works. Uh, I am pretty into hardware, and some of the stuff I use, this is called an MV1, and I have it uh, put into my SP404, which is also Roland. So we probably won't use those since it's a little complicated on, on uh, streaming, but just so you know, that's there, and I do use those. And other than that, um, pieces of the things that don't really matter, but there's a digital piano back there. It's not hooked up in the studio. It's simply for writing and uh, my kid to play on it. So yeah, that's that's the studio, basically. And it's it's as sound treated as I can get it. Uh, not the best, but I will tell you that these sound absorbers on the ceiling are the most important thing. I do have, oh, you're not seeing what I'm showing you. Sorry, I'm, I'm on the camera, uh, phone. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, this is the mobile cam. Uh, studio monitors, oh, wow. and this is a sub. Very important to have the sub for this size of studio monitor. Those are five and a quarter inch, so they're not big, so they don't get those mm -hmm. low frequencies. Is there um, is there a reason your sub is like on the left uh, side from you? There is, um, and you're you're not wrong to ask, ask that question. I'm gonna. I'll share my screen on why it's on that side, but uh, there. So this is the oh, wow. application that controls the speakers. So I can turn the sub on. I can turn speakers off. So you see, this is how they recommended it be set up. Mm -hmm. And I think maybe, Robert, what you're getting at is most people put that in the middle, that sub in the middle. And right. it works better on the side, I think, because of the resonance of the room. Oh, that's fascinating. Um, wow, I did not know that. <laughs> um, we ran a short poll on our YouTube channel um, and uh, presented people with free options. Um, it's uh, regarding the tempo. Um, the, so far, the most favorable option I see is uh, 100 to 130 BPM. Uh, so this is kind of the range that we can look into that yeah, today. I mean, yeah, let's do it. I'm wondering if this... Oh, perfect. Oh, no. Yeah. So it I'm feels like zooming a... in. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's great. So using so the, the Apple, I'm... yeah, using the Ableton, this is where you set up your tempo, right? Yep. And uh, I'm going to, if you show the camera, uh, the mm -hmm. phone camera, I will show you. So let me reposition this. The reason I have this set up is because I do a lot on the push. For example, I'm going to change the tempo. So uh, it's a little off screen, but as you see, I'm turning this knob and we're looking at the tempo change. So yeah, 100 to 130, I mean, there's like four genres in between that. Um, you know what, I, I like 110, 112, 108. Let's start there. And if we need to turn it into dance music, great. If we need to turn it into hip hop, great. We'll just start here. Cool. Uh, yeah, it feels like this is a very comfortable, um setting for um the references i've heard lately like um ariana grounder's latest album there's some dance tracks and that there were 116 uh selena gomez so i feel like the pop music like sits very very comfortably in that region lately um, yep and if we do something that's like you know i think ariana grande's album is sort of like an, a little bit 90s house throwback so mm -hmm. if we're doing something around 115, it's not so hard to bump it up to 120, 124. That's where I'd put that kind of music. Let's mm -hmm. just keep it around. Let's try it. Let's see what happens at 112. So uh, we got the tempo. Any other uh, signifiers? Let's see, what, um, let's see what people think about um, picking a gen generous. Um, uh, let us know if you have a certain preference. Uh, you can do it in any language. Вы можете сделать это также и по-русски. Дайте нам знать о ваших преференциях, что бы вы хотели сегодня услышать. What would you um, like to listen to or co-create uh, tonight? Um, 
Okay, it might take a minute. Well, All right, as so we wait. Then, I see, what first, uh, I see a first comment. It's not necessarily a, a general, it's more like a general direction. It says something smooth and nice, maybe. So, oh, okay. thank you. That's, so, that's it. Uh, I have this. Uh, if you could throw my camera up on the screen. So, I have this base pattern, a uh, kick pattern set up here. Oh, this wow. is on my. So, yeah, let's use that. And so, I, thank you for showing this as I, this is not MIDI synced to Ableton. I, I, I think you all know what I mean by that. So we're just going to drop it in raw, the audio, and then sync it in Ableton to what we need. But the signal flow here is this is going into this. This device is affecting it with like a sort of a warm distortion. So let's just, I'm going to change the BPM of this tempo, or sorry, here to what we're doing, 112. There's lots of ways to do this. I'm doing this the like sort of caveman way, meaning I'm just going to re record audio in. So my process for this kind of thing is I've got Ableton ready. I've got uh, the track enabled. That's how I do that. And I like to have the metronome on. It's going and I just kind of, it's not perfect. It's not right on. So now I'm going to stop that, stop Ableton, and we're just going to go in and edit this. So notice the kick is not on the one. You probably know what I mean by that. Mm -hmm. uh, in Ableton, I you do. Cool. So I'm going to hit this, which means I set that transient to the first beat. So now it's going to oh. be starting at the right. Yeah. And it works and for all of the way from like, so everything that's after that is the same way, right? It should because we recorded it at the same tempo, but if oh, it's okay. not, we're going to fix it. Mm -hmm. It's pretty, yeah, it looks like it's pretty good. So mm -hmm. over here, I am I just set position one. Now six bars, we don't want six bars. We want more like four or two. So I'm just going to change that. And we'll see that it made the loop the right length. See, that's too long. So really, I wanted a two bar. So I'll just go back here and put in two. And we should be good. Now notice uh, it's in the red a little bit. I'm I'm back here at my controller, changing the gain here. Now some of you might go, oh, that's interesting. How come you're not changing it at the fader? You know what I mean, Robert? Why did mm -hmm. I change the gain of the clip versus coming over here and doing this? Oh, and you're controlling it from your pad, right? Yeah, the gain. You this, just, you were, you were just okay. Wow. Yeah. This thing, I do a lot on here just because it's uh, quick for me. And this is why I, I don't see myself upgrading to another push anytime soon, because it kind of just does what it needed to do. So mm -hmm. so I, I'm looking at my uh, summing bus, or master fader, I call it summing bus. And I don't want this kick to take everything up yet, because we're going to try to get that as full as possible without going over. So I'm going to leave it right here. We can always change it, but that's where I want to keep it for now. Cool. That was like way too long of an explanation of the kick, but it's an important part. All right. Now, someone said smooth, which happens to be my favorite uh, adverb in the world. Late night jam. Like, uh, late night oh. jam. That's what another. Ooh, yeah, <laughs> late night jam. Okay. When that was said, I and this is how I produce, I I heard a synth bass line when, when that was said. You know, I do have an, an electric bass back there. I could pull that out, but just the way that late night vibe came to me, okay, that to me says synth bass. I could be wrong, but uh, let's get a synth up. Now, of course, I am partial to Roland synths for many reasons, but uh, I'm using Roland Cloud here, sorry. The way that mm -hmm. I find my synth is I search. So we mm -hmm. probably have some Ableton users out there, right? Yeah, we we very much um, had some. So yeah. Okay. So good. Uh, I hit Command F, and then when I'm looking, I'm I'm gonna use the SH101 synth. So I just start typing SH101, and there it is, right there. So I know I just can drag that to a MIDI track. Oh wow, that's that's very small. Yeah. yeah, and then there it is. So 
this is an interesting uh, synth that came out in, I think, 1978. So uh, that was not smooth. We're not going to use that sound. Uh, since you mentioned sound design, I thought maybe we would start a bass sound from scratch. Oh, well. Which won't take too long. Um, I'm going to zoom in on this again. Let's see if I have it on my hand. Sometimes zoom is actually a, it is. This is cool, right? Check it out. Oh, wow. Yeah. So I like that. that. Um, oh, a lot. <laughs> Because you have all of this little knobs and tweaks, and you know knobs and tweaks, you like you have to, you have to see them. Wow, that's really convenient. Yeah, I mean, usually you can, or you can just drag, or there's an option, but it's, it happens to be a MIDI, uh, a MIDI, what do you call it, a MIDI message. So I can just do that. So anyway, yeah. Uh, let's let's begin designing this sound. So let's let's hear that kick again. Okay, I'm hearing like a. Something that bounces off that. Now I don't like that buzziness, so we're gonna take the filter and get that down. Uh, other things, I want to change the octave of it. If, if you can see my hands all the way down here, and that's that's too low. So I'm gonna do that, and I'm also gonna do this. There we go. So now we're kind of in the right range for a bass sound, right? Bass sound is not too much like that kick, but we might we might uh, deal with that. So we said something smooth. At this point, I get into my head and I go, "Okay, let me turn on my music theory brain." Mm. Um, what is what does smooth mean to me? I might, you know, in a situation like this. So as you might see me doing, I just start grabbing stuff. Things get messy, but it's happening. All right, you all can hear this, right? It's probably not coming in great. Let's stop this and get this ready. So part of uh, production is having everything you need right there. And for that reason, I have this set up. This is a, an amp emulator. Oh, my, you're not showing my screen, but that's OK. So let's get something smooth. Let's go back to. We're going to do C minor 7 to D minor 7. Just two chords. Mm -hmm. I don't know if this is the hook, the chorus, the bridge, the verse. We just got something. <laughs> so, yeah. Yet, right? Yeah. Um, back to my workflow. Um, this is where I use the push. So, audio is coming through here. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn on the metronome, even though we do have this uh, kick going. I just pick any, any pad. It starts to go, so then I get ready. A couple. And then I stop it. I hope I got some good. I put this back here. So now we got to look at that wave. And notice too, with my Ableton session, let's get that lower. I didn't care where I put that clip. Even these two, you know, normal Ableton world, we would have something like this so we can trigger it, trigger them together. But when I'm recording, I don't care. I kind of like to be messy. I kind of like to say, you know what? Creativity has no rules. So again, I'm setting one one on the on the top of that audio. And just like I did before, I'm gonna double click in the position. Can I? Why can't I? There we go. Just now one one is the start point. Looks like it's an eight bar loop. I don't know if I got something good out of that whole thing, but we're gonna just change this to eight bars. So I'm over here uh 
changing these. And now let's trigger it. See, I'm back here on my push triggering. So it's kind of a left, right hand, always moving. <laughs> enough at least. Uh, however, at this point it sounds too, too no, I'm just going off of what I'm hearing. It's too guitarish. So let's we have to throw effects on everything, right? That's that's the whole fun of it. Uh, Command F again, I'm searching. I do have some cool guitar plugins. This uh, archetype what neural DSP, I think they're called they make these cool artist driven plugins and they have some really magical guitar stuff on them. So let's see what we got. That would be phenomenal if you could, because uh, I've been doing it for a number of years and I still can't fully wrap my head around jazz and Jane. It's like, it's always that thing that everybody keeps talking about, especially in the EDM music. And and and, and I even used it before, but it, yeah, if you could go over it, it would be super good, super good. No problem. Uh, Slava said they couldn't hear me. I assume they can now. Oh, okay. Got it. Got it. Okay, I'll try to. Uh, uh, yeah, we. Yeah, I think. Um, I just hear you're being a little quieter when when you uh, when you play the music. Yeah. Got it. Okay. Th that is, I think, what this can help with. But let's just do that. Well, I'll, I'll try to keep the talking when I'm not playing the music. So, side chain compression. Let's 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 clarify what that is. Um, we all know what a compressor is. I'm guessing on this call. Um, look at this compressor as we do that. So uh, yeah, there we go. Thanks. Every compressor has a sidechain. And side, the, the term sidechain compression is a little bit uh, of a misnomer because the sidechain part of the, the way a compressor works is there are two signals. Well, there's one signal that goes into the compressor. The minute it gets into the compressor, it splits into two signals. One is called the program. Let's call this one the program. That's what you're going to hear. That's what the compressor is acting on, processing. The side chain is the same signal in most cases, but this is what the compressor uses to sense how it's going to affect the program. Does that make sense? The side chain, it's split. It turns into a duplicate signal. It becomes the sensor, the trigger for the sensor of the compressor. OK. What we're doing when we're sidechain compressing is we're saying, you know what? Don't split that signal. In fact, take that signal from somewhere else. Most of the times it's the kick. That's what we're going to do. So you're replacing the signal that the compressor usually uses to trigger itself. You're replacing it with new audio. So the new audio becomes a sensor and it acts upon the program. So let's see if that makes sense when you see how I do this. Robert, okay, so we're gonna press side chain here. When I press that, actually, let's not press that. We have two signals coming in. We have the side chain, that's what we're acting on. Threshold. I was talking about the audio, sorry, but let's click the side chain. We're gonna 
choose the audio, that's the kick. And now when I play, one nice thing about this push is I can turn down the master fader. Okay, so this on the left is the kick signal. This on the right is that guitar. When I lower the threshold, the kick signal will then act as the trigger of the compression on the guitar. So that's in essence what sidechain compression is. It's taking one signal and using it as the trigger of the compressor on another signal. And why I think we like the sound of that is because it tricks our brain into thinking that something is so loud. Check this out. If you watch a movie, like a fight movie, a big explosion movie, and they have like a plane crash or a giant bomb go off, there's a moment of silence before you hear the massive explosion. And that is replicating what happens in your eardrum when there's too loud of a sound. Your eardrum has an internal limiter, basically. When something's too loud, it makes it sound like all sound is compressed. So this sidechain compression with the kick on the guitar, or the synth or whatever, it's tricking our brains into thinking something is louder than it actually is. It's also giving us rhythm. Cool. Did that make any sense at all? Yes, yes, it did. Uh, it's a definitely a complex context uh, concept, but um, it definitely helps. Um, we have a couple of um, comments in this section. Um, Glab asks um, if you are going to align the reef with the grid. Um, um, that's a good question. I usually do that. It's pretty good as is. But my main concern of is something is early. Late is OK. For some reason, early is not OK. It seems OK to me, but let's say we did want to do that. A quick way to do that would be to just quantize this. So I'm going to press Shift-Command-U. The current grid is at 1 16th. If I were to quantize this, I think I would do it at eighth notes. Let's see what happens. I kind of like it. It's a little rushed for me, but it's good to know that you can quantize audio. Um, I was always your, sorry, <laughs> just you, you got me on a question about that. Um, I was always curious when we, um, make any edits or manipulations on a uh, waveform that's recorded like naturally right um rather than program and we change uh things uh like like now you put it in a in a right um uh, order and quantize it does it somehow affect the quality of it um uh, like the stretching question. and those little marks is like it yes it does is, is, is it and noticeable enough or like we can just i and then we don't care anymore <laughs> it, it doesn't seem to matter to me anymore i i had questions like that but i will say the kind of warping you do can affect things so mm -hmm. your question is on point with the other like let's say we're time stretching a, a kick pattern right mm -hmm. you don't really want to stretch out a kick unless it sounds good. Look, if it sounds good, then all bets are off. It works. If it's set, if it sounds good, it's fine. Mm -hmm. However, if I do need to time stretch like a kick pattern, I'll, I'll change this to beats because that will, oh. as it's, it will preserve the transients. And you can even say like, please preserve every quarter note. Mm. In that case, you're, you're slicing more than you're stretching. So you're not dealing with too much of those things that are going to cause an artifact. To make your point, let's slow this down. Uh, let me use it now tell me if you hear something. So now you are hearing some artifacts. But 
from yeah, where definitely. It was. we're like half BPM at where we were. So if it gets extreme, then maybe you do want to re-record it, or maybe you're that's the kind of vibe you're looking for. I'll tell I'll tell you this: if you speed things up, quality is not as affected in a bad way because you're you're actually creating a more resolution more resolution in the file. You're mm. you're the same amount of data in a short amount of time is actually higher quality. If you're making oh, yeah, it yeah. slower, right? If you make it slower like we just did, now you're degrading it because you have the same resolution, but it's taking longer to happen. So and I learned that in, in making sample libraries. We would it's kind of like faster. It's kind of like enhancing, uh, like uh, enlarging the image that wasn't of a great quality. It just becomes more pixelated. But, exactly. Yeah. So when you go, go faster, it's like making a thumbnail. It's going to look great. It's going to, you know, but wider, you're turning a thumbnail like into a, you know, poster size. Right. Exactly. Um, but that's also a sound. Like that's a cool lo fi sound too. So maybe you want that. It can work in sound genres, definitely. Exactly. That's right. So we started this at what 112, but if I want to go up to 124 with this, it, sound, it doesn't sound worse. Uh, the kick might I need I might need to think about that and change this over here to beats. So it's, it doesn't sound bad. I, I liked it at the lower tempo just because it's more vibey. Cool. Um, I say we put in a bass line now. What do at we think this, of that? At this point, I also wanted to see um, if, um, do we already have a certain key that we're going in? Is it some, something we can define at this point? Yes. That That's what I tried to establish in my head when I did the guitar. I said, okay, I'm going to do C minor 7 to D minor 7. Mm -hmm. Now I'm in a safety zone of knowing, okay, I pretty much know what the wrong notes are going to be in the right notes. I'm not much of a keyboard player, by the way, so uh, you may see me do some cheating. <laughs> but now I know this, uh, what did I say? Was it D to E or C? Yeah, C to D. D. So those two notes are going to work. might be boring, but we'll want to see what we can do to that. And also we'll be, you know... We have a lot of options with sound design. As I mentioned, one reason boy. one reason I really like this this setup of, of that synth and this is because they're automatically mapped. If you can see the frequency as I as I turn my knob on the keyboard. Mm. Oh yeah. So it, right. So it's easy for me to sit here. I don't have to look. I know. Okay, more release. Sure. I just know what I need to do. I do recommend that, and I know this is said very often, it's better to know a few things really well than like a bunch of things not really well. Mm. Unless that works too. The thing about music is the ends justify the means. So it's like, well, I make music by throwing a rock through a window, but I have a hit. Okay, I can't argue with that. <laughs> uh, not the not the most cost effective way to make music but <laughs> yeah all right but it produces it produces them the way um, if it right. if it's a hit it's a hit now if you stole if you recorded someone else breaking a window and you made that your song well maybe now you have a problem later on but that's a different <laughs> story right so um going back to the composition is um now you have a guitar reef and a, and a drum um like the kick drum uh pattern um naturally inclined to work with keys or bass or still want to work out the bass line right so like i said my process is i hear it and then i say what do i want to hear or sometimes things just i just hear things so i, I hear also i'm like missing the feeling of the bass in my chest i know there should be that feeling so i need to mm -hmm. come up with that and this might not be the best bass sound but we're gonna get it to something. So back to my, my process, I'm back on my push. I have, yeah, thank you. Um, these squares are the ones I'm working with. This one here is the blank one. As you can see, it's record enabled for the entire row. I'll just do what I do. Just hit it. Like that, the metronome on. Let's see what we got. 
see my process here, right? It's kind of kind of always the same kind of way. Where did I get the good thing? Okay, it was over here. Quote, good thing. Cool. You know, my experience tells me that if I play the root and I play the fifth, it's going to be going to work. It does help to have some theory background. And I started this music game, like, I hate to admit it, but in the 90s. And so oh, it was about learning instruments. And now, it's so <laughs> what, what we see right now is the, um, uh, the like I think in different software it's called different. I remember from VL, it's like piano roll and um, mm -hmm. <laughs> one of the ways to call it. Um, and this is where you can uh, like um, align and edit your um, MIDI patterns and MIDI uh, in data, basically, right? Exactly. And I just without even thinking i quantized that and i did what i do so let me oh, yeah. what I did actually. so, so I, i've done this so much i just don't even think but you know we had a clip that was some strange amount of bars because i just let it run i figured out where i wanted it to be and now i'm going to show you what i did here i right clicked and i hit crop clip so that gets rid of the front and the back that i didn't use uh the other way that I look at these when I quantize, I'll zoom in here. You can tell that, for example, this note is really close to this subdividing line. So I'm looking at that and I'm going, okay, what is the widest I can have? Because if I have it like, let's say I have it's a very fine grid. Do you see how the grid is changing? Yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm using command one and two, and you can see what I'm doing if I go down to the lower right. See how it's changing? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is just my own way that I've done this for years, is I, I will have my quantization settings to current grid. And notice I don't have it all the way up. It's pretty close, but it's going to give a mm -hmm. little human feel there. So why I have it on current? You got a, I, I feel a question. <laughs> no? Uh, oh, no, I was just, um, the human feel in, in creating, uh, like, the electronic, producing electronic music, uh, I feel like more and more people now are thinking about, oh, how can I make it a little imperfect, right? Um, yeah. I think you're right. So I'm going to hit up the point, my point being, notice how these are all, there's no line subdividing too far like this this could create a problem right if i quantize to that it's going to quantize it but it's going to be off of eighth notes anyway let me quantize it after all that talk command u boop And then a couple other points with the Ableton. Fold is, is helpful because it gets rid of all the lanes where there are notes, and you can see easier what you're doing. Um, and then, as I did before, I'm going to right click and crop this clip like you're cropping Photoshop, right? Mm -hmm. Now, the clip doesn't have any hanging stuff from the left or the right. It wouldn't matter if it did, but it's just visually easier to deal with for me. Also, if you're an Ableton user, Option Command L opens and closes the bottom window. I use that a lot. Oh, uh, yeah, that's that's definitely helpful. Yeah. So now I'm dragging that clip up to the top so that back here on my push, you you end up triggering what they call scenes by uh, buttons on the right. So I can just. Hear the quantization. I actually want it all the way up. I have a very uh, sensitive ear for this. Okay, cool. So if you hear any clicking, it's because my buffer is not able to handle this. So let's change the buffer a bit. That's something. Have you all 
had the pleasure of having to change your buffer yet. Um, yeah, does it happen often that you have to um, readjust the buffer for like in a production if, workflow? If you're doing what we're doing here, which is streaming through loop back, going into StreamYard, yeah, oh, sometimes, yeah. yeah. And to be honest, if I'm recording vocals or something, I really can tell the difference between like 68 and one this area versus these kind of areas. Mm. It's something I'm aware of. Mm -hmm. And fortunately, Ableton lets you change it pretty easily. Like Pro Tools, you have to, it restarts. Oh, yeah, I know. I've <laughs> I had those issues before. <laughs> yeah. If you're running on like a low end machine and, uh... And you don't have an audio interface to back you up. Yeah, you're 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 in you're in the pickle. You are where Skrillex was when he started. How about that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he he figured out a, a flawless way to keep the sound just as distorted. <laughs> I know. Uh, I really like his music. Um, it's interesting. Fortet is a sort of famous electronic music artist, and he just posted his setup for his most recent album, and it's literally like a laptop looking at a window. <laughs> so I say that to just, no, don't don't feel like your tools will hold you back if you don't have the best computer or this or that. You know, it's possible to make beautiful art on almost anything. Speaking of which, let's record what we have. So I'm, as you can tell, I'm kind of ready to get out of the zone. Um, so let's record that in. The reason I'm doing this, the reason I'm doing this is because I want to automate the filter on the bass, and I it's going to be longer than the loop we had, so I wanted to give myself like at least you know 16 bars or something. Uh, I don't know if that was 16 bars or not, but. We can just do this. Sometimes I'll do that. I'll just get like a little bit in and just drag it to where I need it. Cool. Now, unfortunately, this means I don't get to use the push as much. I wish they had some integration for more on this side of things. Mm. Um, I just have a weird idea to put an auto pan on that guitar. Something that we can so, do with that. Go ahead. Yeah. I was just looking. So you set the auto paid for 116 rate, and that makes it like a strobe like, right? Because um, yes, I thought. I forgot. It, mm -hmm. Wow. Good. Yeah. Yeah. I, I was just thinking I... logic. In logic, sometimes you use like the auto filter, um, but it works with the frequency more. Here it's just like you, you're just throwing it left and, left and right. Yep. It's a. Uh... It's volume. Is it going left right? Yeah, it is. So this is sort of cheating. This will be the left and right. I really wanted to use it as a tremolo or like a gate effect. So we are we're cheating it a little. But because I think when you really load this plugin, I think I changed my default. It's this. centered and makes it just be a volume effect. And you can... So that could be a cool trick you might do later on. Um, I won't spend too much more time on the guitar, but it's kind of bothering me. So uh, this is one of the things I use a lot. I use these emulators. Um, I don't know if anyone's experienced these at all. It looks weird. Uh, oh, wow. The reason it looks... It's a, uh, a recreation of a hardware channel strip mm -hmm, on, mm -hmm. on a giant board, right? So It reminds me of the SSL, right? One of exactly. Yeah. It's exactly like that, except it's API instead of SSL. I have the SSL ones, too. Um, and this is a good thing probably for, for everyone to know is 
presets are great. Somebody knew what they were doing and more than me. So I'm just gonna, sometimes I'll just do this to get a sound just enough to like make me believe it. It's just a little bit more real. Cool. Um, so that's all I wanted to do there. Now, <laughs> my original plan here was to have this bass I'll turn my uh, Ableton down real low. It's too low. So I'll do some kind of little filter thing here just, just so we can have automation. And then because we don't have a lot of time, I'm going to suggest we think of another section. Because it's it's to me it's easy to stack sounds, but it's hard to linearly create something that makes sense. If that mm. makes any sense. Yes, yes. Um, when you think about different sections, um, I think I've seen, I mean, personal experience situations when you like um, you have a baseline that's um, structured. You want to keep going with this, but you also don't don't want it to you know just go for the rest of the song like like just the same same thing same bit um in the situations where you're like all right i'm not working with it at all i'm just leaving it and i'm starting from the scratch in the same key uh and then it's really hard to glue them together <laughs> so mm -hmm. i know um but yeah what, do, do you have a pathways to like navigate yourself into different sections um that's a great question i've seen some people so uh, another Ableton thing, Shift Command D will duplicate sections. I've seen some people just go, you know what, keep that, get rid of that, and then that's how we're going to do it. But yeah. that, that's one way to do it. Um, I tend to, I will let's do that actually, but I tend to think quarterly more than anything. So I again, my process is pretty much always the same. I listen to it. I go, what do I want to hear, or what do I just hear out of that? So I'll probably go back to the thing that started the whole thing, and it, it doesn't have to be complicated. What follows that? Maybe this. Hmm. That would make sense. But mm -hmm. okay, then what? It can't just sit there. So, so I'm I'm just trying to figure something out. So maybe I'll if I think I have something, and I don't know if you guys are gonna think this is weird, but I, I probably will go back to the screen for this. But I'm gonna hear the, a little bit of that. What happens if I go B flat? Sort of a symmetrical now my nerd brain is talking but let me get over here so uh in the camera in the uh, phone screen those were the first chords minor seven chords now i'm thinking okay we did a whole step seven thing so i'm, I'm music theorying hopefully that's okay but if we do a major seven thing do the same interval of the chords but now we're doing major sevens could work. Let's see. So I'll go back here and I'll just repeat my process. So my guitar is already enabled. And the cool thing is if I hit this, it's going to not play the original guitar track, but record it to the same track. <laughs> Baseline kept playing and it was wrong, but that's okay. A lot of music production for me is is just 
it's like living in a messy room and being okay with it. But the thing is, you have to clean your room at the end of the day. I think it's going to work, y'all. So at this point, and to me, it's important visually to have something that is distinct. So I'm not going to get confused when I drag and drop the, the, this part. It's blue. There's no way I can confuse it with the orange part. So you see how we're kind of putting this together now. Mm -hmm. And if you're not familiar with Ableton, to get it to play back on this view, I have to press that button. Oh. So what's missing, yeah, I'm going back and forth between the views a lot. And it's just, uh, most people don't do this. Some do, you know, my, my friend, John, he doesn't do this at all. He uses just the arrangement view. We got to get that E flat to F note in there. So I'll just record it. And I'm just so into this view, I have to do it over here. But now notice, let me get rid of this. So here is the first part. Thank you, Robert. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is the second part. They're not next to each other. They don't have to be. I'm just creating parts, and the bass goes mm -hmm. in the middle. So I'm holding down on that to make it a recording. Now I could play any of these slots, but I'm going to do this one because it makes sense. So uh, what I got to do? E flat to F. Same process. There it is. And we're going to quantize again. Like I said, I'm looking at 132, way too fine, 116. Yeah, I think I think eighth notes is going to work. And then I'm just command U. You know what? I don't think eighth notes is going to work, especially since that was quarter notes. There we go. So I'm looking just to see where these lines line up to the grid. They're not perfect like this one here. Mm -hmm. Once I quantize it, though, it's they snap to the right ones because there's no subdivision clo too close to them that's not right, if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. All right. Now the big test is going to be how they go together. Oops, we got that. So this is what we want. So I, I should have changed the color of this. Otherwise, I'll get confused later. Before you saw me record it in, you can also just click and hold it and hit tab and then drop it onto the track. Oh, wow. And then I hit that button. Yeah. So. The other thing I'll do here, just to make things easy, is I'll put a marker. I'll put one on both spots, and you'll see why I do that in a second. That's done by, I have a shortcut, but hitting the set. Boop. So now we have one and two. And let's start it at one. Now, turn, turn this down enough. OK, yeah. So. At any point, we can try two. Wow, it's like almost three chords. Mm -hmm. So let's see what happens when we go back to one. sure which is the first which is what we got to figure that out and i've also realized i've automated my master fader which is why things keep ducking there we go all right i'm gonna side chain the bass as well 
So in this case, it's easy because I already have done this. So I'm on the guitar track now. If I just hold Option on that compressor and drag, I can drag it to the bass track. So just like that. And then we go to the bass track we already have. <laughs> take too much i want to have something at least for you all to play with at the end of this that makes sense but i also want to show you as much as possible so i'm going to show you a, another sidechain trick because notice the sidechain is that bass that bass drum pattern that's like boom, da -doom, doom, doom, right but that's making this uh bass sound kind of weird <laughs> rather have the sidechain just be on the downbeats. So basically, I'm going to create a kick that's only for sidechaining, and we're not even going to hear the kick. It's just going to become the sidechain signal. Oh, my. Uh, and I'm going to do that using the 909 plugin. This is probably my favorite plugin on the planet. What's it called again? It's the TR909 Roland plugin. So the, the 909 is one of the most famous drum machines out there. Oh, yeah. Almost as famous as the 808. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. Are they right. available, like, in physical form now? Or? No, they stopped being produced in 1983. Oh. And wow. uh, that's why these plugins are so great, is they had the same engineers that developed the original hardware working on the software, and they really nailed it. Um, I, in fact, two days ago, I was at a, an, an event and we had a real Juno 106 in the plugin and we AB tested it. I totally failed. I couldn't wow. do it. Yeah. It's nuts. Incredible. So here's what I have. And we may use that later, but I'm going to turn the volume way down on that. Go back to my side chains this is the guitar and we're just going to change it to 909 because i just want a four on the floor trigger for that not a boom ba -doom, boom boom so i'm just using the 909 as a trigger basically Without actually hearing the, the drum, you still get that punchy wave response. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Exactly. And one one thing people do, or you could do, is just this is your side chain track, and you know every time you're side chaining, and people even side chain like a limiter on the master fader, but this can just be the trigger that you need. Mm. And sometimes you'll have a section where you want a different side chain trigger, different pattern, make two tracks, have side chain one, side chain two triggers. Oh. You know, we may decide too that I don't even like that original key. There's this and these plugins work best if you boost the game. that you know what actually Robert since you have the SSL plugins let's use that and I'm just again I, I want it to sound real I want it to sound like it went through an expensive board just just for now um, target I'm to curious the that when um, listening to some tracks that you know mastered and I don't know, Ster Sterling sound or like some high-end studios and then uh, comparing them sometimes you feel like most of the time they're just sound not only clean but they don't sound as bassy they just like like almost perfectly like I don't know like a 
like a fresh linen, like just down with the laundry. So that's a great point because many times we're thinking we need more bass. We need more bass mm -hmm. because you know, we're listening in there or we're listening in our small studio speakers. That's why I like having a sub because, for example, you know, you turn on that area on a grande track, there's a lot of bass in that. But maybe not as much as you think when you're not able to hear the bass. So, and by the way, I am not an expert on mixing, but I'll, I'll tell you what I've found is that keeping an eye on this is very important. And I, right now that's okay. For an instrumental track, I try to get the volume all the way. Other people tell you differently, but I want to get the volume all the way as close as, as close as here as possible. I will try. Mm -hmm. um, and that's just for what we're doing right now. If we had vocals on here, maybe it'd be different. Okay, so let's let's try to turn this into something that, that sounds like something. So let's listen to it really quick. Uh, but for the sake of time, I'm going to cut each section in half. So yet another shortcut, shift command X. It, I think it's called a ripple edit. It takes it away, but it doesn't leave a blank space. It's not like this. So that's just, you know, mm -hmm. shift command X. Yeah, man and, oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. sections different and what can we do to make them more different also we have to think of what the purpose of this is if this is for a singer this this effect here on guitar that might be hard to write against it might be too rhythmic so maybe we do um it depends on what you're going for as a producer if if you're like okay i'm, I'm writing with artists i'm producing artists then you want leaving a space for the lead vocal. If you're like, no, I'm going to DJ this and it's going to bang in a club, well, then that's a different scenario. But I'm pretty sure most of the artists I work with would go, ah, that's too busy. Or this, this is nice. So if you like that vibe, what I and I do, let's just make this happen. It'll be a fill thing into sections. So I've, I'm going to uh, change the automation of the on off of that. And I'm doing this because we want it to be very clear when sections are happening. Oops. So sometimes I'll I'll do automation where I perform it, and sometimes I'll just do it where I draw it. Let's see how that goes. helpful for human listeners to hear obvious section changes. Like we like to go, oh, it's coming, it's coming, it's here. Ah, oh, yeah, that was the chorus, you know? Yeah. We like that. Definitely. So I would, in a further developmental stage of this, I would be putting in drum fills, really making, you know, helping the listener 
sometimes it helps to think of these songs as as plays or movies. Mm -hmm. Who is the lead character right now? And this is mixing helps a lot too. Some people are like, well, how, what what frequency should I adjust? And sometimes I'm like, well, who's the lead? We need to. If this is a TV show. We can't have all the characters talking at once. We can't follow every storyline at once. We have to clearly show who the lead is. If the lead is the vocal, then we don't have the lead yet. If it's the guitar, well, then we know how we should fix this or what we should do. Uh, but, but it's not going to know what we want. So I'm going to suggest this. Uh, well, actually, Robert, how much time do we have? Oh, uh, we have another good 10, 15 minutes. We can do that. OK. Um, we want to save this. I, I went so long without saving this, it's actually criminal. Call it that April was it May twelfth, and I do like to, even though if you look at my weird nothing names there, but I do like to put the BPM. The oh BPM. yes, yes, of course. So I've been doing this so long that it actually matters what year I did this in. <laughs> so I, I now have to write that. So uh, I don't know if you noticed what I did there, but you collect all I save for your Ableton users. Mm. If you don't do that, then that audio file will live in a temp file. And let's say oh. you're like, oh, yeah, Robert, I want you to work on this now. I send this over to Robert. If I didn't collect all and save, he's going to get missing audio. Oh, right. Yeah, it's like it's just... set in a project without the actual materials and content. Exactly. And I kind of think it's lame that Ableton's like, as a default, we're going to make it so you screw up. So <laughs> here's an extra step for you to remember to do. Right. <laughs> and, you know, I've, I've been teaching this in schools and like literal instructors and Grammy professionals are like, ah, oh, I forgot to do that oh, again. Oh. <laughs> so I don't feel bad. Um, I'm going to add a, a little bit of percussion now crash to just tell us that this is happening, that the, there's a section change. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I might as well show this. I, I do splice from time to time. I'm sure you all know what splice is. Oh, of course, yeah. Yeah. So tell, it, it helps to sort of stay on a budget. <laughs> now, I don't know, you know, what kind of song is this? Sure. Um, that's a that's a good question. We we had a comment saying that it sounds like a jingle for a podcast. <laughs> so that could make a lot of money, I suppose. I don't know if I love that, but <laughs> it does sound like that, darn it. All right. Whoops. So maybe we like that, maybe we don't. I'm just gonna get something here that to, to tell us that there's a section change. <laughs> situations you find yourself in. <laughs> okay, well, if this was just me by myself, I would probably want to add a, a pad, something to fill the sound more. Mm -hmm. And I thought also, to get it out of the podcast zone, <laughs> um, I'm going to add a vocal. And this is just a temporary vocal. So I, I use this plugin called Arcade for this. Mm -hmm. it's basically, yeah, cool. So some, some of you may have heard of it. It's, well, they do a lot of advertising on YouTube, that's for sure. Um, I do this because it helps to hear what might be really happening. And I like this, you know, there are these lines, these kind, these banks, basically. This hooked one. Well, let me ask the group this. Do you hear a female vocal or a male vocal over this? Let's ask the audience. What do you think, guys? Um, we have two options, really, <laughs> right now. Um, OK, I see I see a vote for a female voice. And uh, OK. Yeah, I think, yeah, it's fair. Cool. I'll do this one that's called Night Chill. I think that's probably relevant. 
So, one interesting thing about this is you get to choose your key. Oh, uh, that's fascinating. Which is interesting because I don't think it's going to be in the same key. Actually, you got to think about this. I went from C minor seven to E minor seven. Now, if you're a nerd like me, you know that that kind of puts you in a B flat major. We'll see if that works. We may just have to do uh, C minor, but we'll, let's just see what happens here. So it's telling me, OK, that's not the original key. It's going to be three steps up. Mm -hmm. So like mm -hmm. Robert, we talked about, it may change the quality of the sound, but going sharp is going to be better than going flat. Mm -hmm. We don't. I, I just, I just came away. I just came. I just came away. I just came away. This plugin works in an interesting way. Um, if you could show them my keyboard again. Feels right. Feels right. By holding the note in one octave and then playing the note in the lower octave. Feels right. Feels right, feels right, feels right, feels right, feels right. Kind of weird. All I want is a little vibe out of this thing. I don't want to take it. Feels right. Feels right. Feels right. Maybe takes it out of podcast zone. Maybe it doesn't. Yeah. Um, I would also. Feels right. So another another trick. Uh, going back to our emulations. So I, I know just to type in the name of the plugin, Vision API. Since this is a female vocal, it will absolutely be a vocal preset. Rihanna's secret boot. Feels right, feels, feels right, feels right, feels, feels right, feels right, feels right. So just add by reverb and delay. I'm doing that by uh, adjusting my options. Feels right, feels right. All right, Robert, I'm going to do one final trick and then I will check in. See where we're at. This is a vocal production thing. I want automation, but I don't want it on every single syllable. Right. So just when it says right, I want to boost that. you have an automation lane, if you hold option, you have the ability to turn on it. I don't know why I thought I needed that, but... There, that's right. I'm just doing this because it's cool. Yeah. It's funny, it's all. We don't have anything for the hook, the chorus, but I'm going to do my final process. And remember, I said I wanted this to be pretty close to filling the entire song. Um, and then just to hear what it might sound like mastered. I will search for 
there's many of these kinds of plugins out here, but I've been using this one lately. The God Particle. Oh, I heard about it, yeah. It automatically makes things sound like it's on the radio. Hmm. So here's with it off. I'll turn it on in mid in mid uh, playback. put out there I would use way more hardware I would probably resample a lot for example bounce stuff put it in the hardware record it back in I'm personally really interested in the way things sound just the quality of their sound so those are ways that I get different sounds cool all right so there's that well we have we have the project and um, um, just to e explain a little to our audience again um, this is something that will be available to you uh, to remix uh, to maybe a continuous story um, and um, the best works will be selected um, Next week, we are planning a feedback uh, session about the uh, same time as today. Um, and you can bring your songs, you can bring your projects for feedback from Jared. Um, um, it will be on Zoom. So you also have uh, um, an opportunity to talk um, about your projects as well. Present them. Um, that's mostly what we have for you for, you for today. Uh, Thank you, Jared. Um, My pleasure. Yes. If you I will, have any final thoughts to share. Uh, my final thoughts are this. If I was to send this, which I'm going to send this to everyone, I don't want to send it in this form because most likely you don't have the same plugins, et cetera. So this is something you all should know about Ableton if you don't already. I want to freeze and flatten these takes, uh, turn them into audio, basically, so that you don't so I'm going to start by freezing, which I suppose I could send you just frozen tracks, but then uh, you know what I'll do? I want you to also have the MIDI. So notice how I duplicated that. I'll flatten this one. This one will stay frozen, muted. So you can unfreeze it, take the MIDI, and do other stuff with it. Guitar. Probably if you have, no, see, I don't know what uh, DAW you're going to use. So I basically have to send you audio stems. All right. So I will, here's what I'll do. I will do this process. I'll include this Ableton session, and then I'll also send stems. And if you want to do it, Logic, Pro Tools, GarageBand Studio One, throwing the rock through the window, you know what I mean? Do whatever you need to. Just not my window. Because <laughs> that's my sample. <laughs> Well, thanks again. Um, this was fantastic. We have some um, good feedback already coming in the sections, uh, in the comment section. Um, and then we will group next week. And um, I'm hoping that's enough time for everyone to work on their remixes. I, I might try to, um, you know, play around with it too. So <laughs> it'll be fun to try. Sounds great. So once I bounce these stems, uh, I'll throw them in that Google Drive, and it'll probably be in the next 20 minutes. Yes. We'll share the link uh, with everyone who uh, registered for that event, and um, they'll also be up on our YouTube channel for this video, so um, in the description. So thanks again, everyone, Great. and um, we'll see you next week. All right, looking forward to it. Bye-bye.